Good morning, good afternoon or good evening, depending on where you are joining us from today. Um, I'm Tracy Green. I'm the clinical manager with Sigvaris Group Britain here in the UK. And I would like to welcome you to our MOH challenging ulcer cases from all over Europe. We know that leg ulceration can be challenging to manage, and I'm sure that the presentations today will help uh, in some way to um, increase our knowledge and skills in managing these conditions. But before I go any further, I really would like to introduce my co-moderator for today's session, Professor Omar Farouk. Um, I'm absolutely honoured, Professor Farouk, that you can join us today. Um, Professor Omar is a consultant vascular surgeon in Egypt and he's a very keen educator. He's got over 30 years experience in the field with extensive knowledge and experience in vascular and endovascular procedures. So as I said, um, Professor Omar, thank you so much for joining us and helping us today. And I'll hand over to you. Thank you very much, uh, Tracy. That is great. I'm honored and delighted to join you and honor and delighted with all the attendees. Uh, hopefully we'll start a journey that is a fascinating journey. We will have four countries in Europe discuss how they handle one of the most difficult problem, which is venous ulcer. Who is succeeding? What is the best way? Is there is any genetic differences? So it's a very exciting webinar. I'm really excited to be here. Uh, the overall uh, scenario will have four lectures. Uh, each one will discuss the best practice from this country regarding venous ulcer. We have selected Austria, uh, Greece, Italy, and Romania. So it is really exciting that we are all sharing our experience. I will have an overview of our panelists, which are speakers. Uh, and we are very thankful to them, Dr. Gregor Holzer from Austria, Dr. Dimitris Papastavro from Greece and Slovakia, uh, Professor Luca Gazaben from Italy, and lastly, Christian Silosi and Dr. Catalin Vakulescu uh, from Romania. Uh, I will introduce everyone before his presentation. So I'm delighted to present the first speaker, uh, Gregor Holzer. He is professor of dermatology and uh, lecturer in University of Vienna. And he's also vice president of Austrian Society of Dermatology and the Cosmetic and Age Research a fascinating field in relation to venous ulcer. God knows what will happen if we live a bit longer, how much the prevalent will be venous ulcer. He's also chief physician, Department of Dermatology in Clinicum Dodgestad. He's also, his medical expertise include not only clinical dermatology, allergy, and the chronic inflammatory skin condition, but he's also uh, especial in phototherapy and cosmetic dermatology. I would like to welcome Professor Kroger for his first presentation, speaking on the best practice of venous ulcer in Austria. Professor Kroger. Yes. Let me share my slides. So, Thank you very much for the invitation. Um, I brought a case which is not a very common case. And I called it, it's an ulcer case and it was a very challenging ulcer case. That's why I called it, don't lose your nerves because that was what was happening. What I said to myself all the time because the patient is getting worse and worse and the pain was getting more and more and I kept just keep your nerves and finally we found a good resolution. So I'd like to present a, a patient. It was an old patient, 80 years old and he had a post-traumatic ulcer. That's how he was presented himself to us. And he developed skin changes after um, an injury um, he had um, six weeks before. He had a lot of comorbidities. He had a metabolic syndrome. He had diabetic renal insuff insufficiency. He had um, atrial fibrillation. He had a pacemaker, sleep apnea. So there was a lot of going on in, in the terms of um, comorbidities. 
And he also he had received several medications when he presented him uh, himself. So he had metformin, furosemide, he had um, statin, um, and of course, um, macroma as well. So that's how he presented himself. So what we can see on this picture is a levetoid reticular, um, levato reticularis pattern on both legs, on, on both lower legs, ulceration, um, with hemorrhagic crusts and also um, fibrine coats. And also there were some tiny spots of like whitish appearing um, atrophic areas. And on the other leg, the ulcer situation was a little bit not as traumatic, but still as painful. And then he had in, in a third ulcer he had on, on his right foot, um, fibrine coated, erythematous, very painful. So what are the differential diagnoses for these patients? So first of all, we thought about alleviated vasculopathy. We thought about maybe had some um, vasculitis going on, like a polyarteritis nodosa. Maybe it was just a black ulcer due to hypertonia. Maybe it was ulcer ulcus hypertonicum. Maybe it just had peripher peripheral arterial disease. We also thought about calciphylaxis because it was so painful. And of course, we also thought about maybe, um, about we thought of a necrosis maybe due to coumarin. And of course, we wanted to rule out that there was some embolization process going on, maybe it was cholesterol. So what we did, we did a biopsy from the, from the ulcer. And what we can see here is that he had um, um, intraluminal, um, he had a very vascular lymphocyte infiltrate. He had thrombi in the small vessels, as you can see here, and he had um, erythrocyte extravasations. So bringing it all together, the clinical presentations and the histopathology, we decided um, for the diagnosis of levetoid vasculopathy. So of course, this was not the only thing we did. We did a thorough checkup so um, he had in the C-reactive protein was elevated, as was the erythrocyte sedimation ESR. Um, and, and subsets and ANCAS were all negative. Um, as well, the thrombophilia diagnostics were also inconspicuous. The only thing which we found was an elevated homocysteine. And of course, we did some, um, some duplex sonography to rule out peripheral arterial disease and couldn't find any relevant um, pathology concerning this um, diagnosis. But as it was not very, um, we couldn't do it um, to the lower leg. We also did an angiography. We didn't reveal any pathology in the lower leg. And of course, because we all thought about the embolization um, process going on in the background, maybe at endocarditis, we also did a, um, a echocardiography but there was um, nothing to be found. What was the therapy? Well, the therapy, first of all, um, we gave him, um, we changed the macoma to enoxaparin. So from, from the macoma to, to a low uh, molecular weight heparin, twice a day in the beginning, then once a day. Then we also, as, the, as I will show you later with the photos, the situation didn't get better and it kind of deteriorated. We also started IV immunoglobulins and he received nine cycles for eight months. We also started with pentoxifiline, 300 milligrams um, twice daily. And because he had hyperhomocysteinemia going on in the background, we gave him folic acid and vitamin B. And um, because of this severe process, um, he didn't have any infectious parameters, but still he had a lot of um, pseudomonas in his wounds. We gave him an antibiotics, um, maybe because we were also kind of um, desperate because he was not getting better so quickly. And of course, we had appropriate wound therapy um, with regular mechanical wound cleaning and dressing change once a week. And now this is the follow-up, as you can see. Um, that is the patient in the beginning. And this was like after two cycles of um, immunoglobulins, you see the demarcation of the ulcer. So the, the, the area of the ulcer was getting much bigger. And that's when we said to ourselves, don't lose our nerves, don't lose our nerves. The, the patient was in deep pain, but with the continuation of the treatment, um, 
we saw the healing of the ulcers with just conservative therapy, no surgery needed. And after um, nine cycles, the patient, um, the ulcers had totally healed. One moment. So levetoid vasculopathy is like a skin infarction. It's not a very common um, ulcer um, problem, but it exists. We have several cases of those. So in general, you have like this levator racimolda pattern, which levator racimolda is a term that doesn't exist in English, but it's a patchy levator reticularis pattern. You have the, the, then you have these white spots of atrophy blanche, and third, but not last, the painful ulceration. Thromboembolic, um, it's a thromboembolic occlusive disease of the cutaneous vascular plexus. That's why it's like, a, it's not an infarction of the heart, but it's like a skin infarction. And there are several diseases which can be associated with this kind of disease, which can be collagenosis like lupus erythematosus or phospholipid antibody syndrome. It can be coagulation disorders. In our case, it was hyperhomocysteinemia, which was associated with. It can be um, elevated paraproteins. And of course, it can be a chronic venous disease, it can be in the background. And the problem with this disease is because it's not as, um, common as a regular venous ulcer. There have been various therapeutic approaches. And the main um, approach in therapy is to give anticoagulation. There have been now several um, reports for viraroxaban, but also still for low molecular weight heparins, which are frequently used. There are cases for fantoxifrilin, and there's, uh, there are several cases for immune modulation by EVIC therapy, like we did it in our patient. And it's always important if you have an underlying condition like a collagenosis or like a, um, another, any other vascular disease to correct this disease first. So now I'm in, at the end of my talk and I'm happy to receive any questions. Excellent, that's a fascinating uh, case. And uh, thankfully you got your nerve right until you got the patient off table. So uh, I will open the question to our panelists and then our attendee. If any of the panelists have a question, I have a small question, but I will keep it until the end. Yes, uh, Professor have, Dimitris, yes. Uh, I'm not Professor, I'm just a doctor, thank you. But uh, okay. I have two questions. Fascinating, uh, uh, Dr. Gerber. It's a uh, vasculitis always is a great challenge, mm -hmm. and uh, I my answer that okay. How do you classify these also? Do you classify it as a big ulcer? Do you classify it as ones by ones or just a vasculitis also? Because uh, you didn't mention about the compression therapy. Do you use mm -hmm. compression therapy? Yes yeah, no? in the end we, we used it because um, well, first of all, it's great. So so if you ask me about the classification of an ulcer, well. Um, Personally, I would think this is not one of those ulcers which you can, like it's an ulcer which is probably in the category of vascular ulcers, maybe mm -hmm. associated because the, the problem is um, um, concentrated in vascular superficial plexus. So it would be a vascular ulcer, um, mm -hmm. but it has the levedo. It's a, it used to be regarded as a more um, in like a, like a more, um, vasculitis, it's not a vasculitis. So there's no, no um, inflammation in the sense of vasculitis going on. First of all, it's like, a, as we know now, it's a thrombolic um, um, process which starts this kind of ulcer. So it would be a vascular ulcer in the broader sense. And compression therapy, we did, um, um, not in the beginning because the leg, the, 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 the ulcer was so painful. But um, when we started, the, when the healing process started to, when we saw the healing started, we did compression therapy as part of the wound um, management. Mm -hmm. But I think we, we are not with um, compression stocking, but with um, bandages. So UNA's boot style. Um, the UNA boot style, I think, as far as I recall, I think we did with elastic bandages. Um, the un, no, no, un, not, un, not like as rigid as Unaput. Okay, thank you. But um, the compression in this context was the last of our worries, to be honest, mm -hmm. because we were much more worried first about the pain, seeing um, healing going on, and then 
proper wound dressing, but um, at the end of the his treatment, the compression became more and more important, of course. Yeah. Excellent, excellent. That's great. Uh, any other question from the panelist? Yeah, we've got one uh, from me. Okay, yeah. please do. Okay. Yeah. Did you did you work with other specialities when you for these cases? I mean, like a diabetic doctor or um, X-ray doc or stuff like this, or just yes, of course, yeah, yeah. Like like of course, as you said, we did. Um, um, we worked together with a radiologist, of course. Mm -hmm. um, we worked um, together with the. Um, yeah, an interventional radiologist because of all the, um, also we had an angiography and we worked together, of course, um, we have a wound manager from our nursing department, um, which did all the wound management, of course, this is like, but she's like part of our team. So um, I would not regard her to be, you know, an extra specialist. Um, yes. And of course, you know, we, we talked to several people from, internal medicine because he had so many comorbidities they were always had to twitch and tweak his other medications so yes of course this is not a case and this is typical a case um, who has to be um, dealt with in hospital and the patient has to be hospitalized of course because it was so painful and you need all these different specialities working together and yes so this is definitely yeah. a challenging also case which is yeah. Has to be so it was multidisciplinary treatment. Yeah, 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 exactly. Excellent, excellent. I, I, I will ask you just one final question. What if the patient has not improved? Would you have thought of corticosteroid, plasmapheresis? I know you will keep your nerves uh, very strong, but yeah, no, I no, no, to demonstrate what further option do you have? Um, I think um, we would maybe have changed also the anticoagulation at some point, maybe to real roxaban, which we could have done. Yeah. Um, I know that in the back, you, people used to give corticosteroids to liver with vasculopathy, but uh, as we know now, it does not change. It's not um, so much helpful for the, for the pathology in the background. So um, maybe we would have done corticosteroids just as a salvage therapy, but it's, um, I think, um, yeah, that would have been the next step. Excellent. It, it was a great case, and uh, we enjoyed having the trip of treatment with you. We enjoyed every second of it. I will give the mic to uh, my dear colleague, uh, Tracy, uh, for the question. Please, Tracy. Um, right. Could we have the first poll question, please? So what we're going to do is just see if you've uh, been listening. Um, so we'd like you to um, click on the correct answer for this. So what is the most common cause of venous ulcers? Um, and it's a single choice answer. So um, arterial insufficiency, trauma or chronic venous insufficiency. We'll have around 30 seconds for you all to answer and then we'll go on to um, discuss from there. So if you just click your choice and press the submit button. Thank you. It usually takes about 30 seconds, which uh, looks like a 10 minutes uh, job. Yeah. But it is 30 seconds. <laughs> Okay, well, we've got 98% um, saying chronic venous insufficiency. So, um, yep, yeah, well done. We've got 2% saying trauma. Um, so just if I could maybe pass that over to the um, either Professor Romo or to the panellists to maybe discuss that response. Yeah, um, yeah. sometimes the trauma can cause venous ulcer, but it is not the commonest, uh, which is definitely the question, uh, but it, it can be cause of a trauma. If any of the panelists want to comment, but definitely if I am in, uh, in let us say, in an exam, uh, I wouldn't accept trauma as the commonest. The commonest is definitely chronic venous insufficiency, which grows uh, in percentage per year as a patient gets older and trauma is get much less. Uh, any comment from the panelists you'd like to add? I would like to say a comment. Of course, don't forget yeah. the hemorrhoids. 
uh, of the varices, the varicose hemorrhagia, which is very, yeah. very common because, you know, insufficiency, hemodynamics, uh, blood, yes. uh, uncontrolled veins. So uh, maybe I will say the, the, the hemorrhoids is more than trauma because it's very often that after this are not close. I will say yeah. trauma as an accident of the, the varicose hemorrhagia because varicose hemorrhagia, it's more common than the trauma. Yes, especially yeah. when you are in the AR, almost one or two times every week, you will have a varicoraya, and it's uh, also it's what cause of the vein ulcer. Yeah, that's true. That's why the, the name chronic venous insufficiency is not a single identity. <laughs> it actually is a syndrome of uh, a big variety of, of diseases. Definitely subcutaneous hemorrhage is, is one of them for chronic venous sufficiency due to high venous pressure around the ankle area. So that's true, but well, I think the question asked about the basics, who is the commonest? Uh, and they want to know that uh, insufficiency is, is on top of that. Excellent, that's a great uh, reply and discussion. We'll move to the uh, second, uh, second the fascinating part of our presentation. I would like to present uh, a, a great speaker from Greece and Slovakia and a dear friend. He is uh, Professor Papastavro, Dimitrios. He is a vascular surgeon with endovascular phrobology experience. He did work in the Greek army and he completed his fellowship in Maastricht, uh, Venus Diseases, which is one of the very eminent centers to give uh, Venus phrobology uh, master degree in Maastricht. He's also participated in numerous congresses from the uh, European International Society of Phrobology. Uh, he's also well known for his sclerotherapy experience, um, and he has learned this, this from uh, Professor Tissari himself by having workshop with Professor Tissari. He is now a lecturer uh, in the Medical University of Vascular Surgery. Uh, Professor uh, Dimitris, we're delighted to have you, and you can present your uh, venous ulcer case from Greece. Please go ahead. Okay. Do you see my screen? Yeah. Okay. Um, so I we start from the basics. Um if, if I just I'd like to add, you need to share desktop, not share the presentation in order to have a full screen. Do you see my presentation? Yes. Okay. Uh, yes, yeah, but not in the presenter view. Dr. Dimitrios, so please share your desktop. The yes, share desktop. On yeah. the left side. Okay, now you see. Uh, we see the presentation. Uh, okay. If you open presenter view, uh, okay. I think it's. Yes, yes, that's it. Okay. That's for the screen. Okay. Excellent. Okay, okay, thank you. Sorry, thank you. For I'm gonna go for some short, short preview and then I will go through, uh, we'll start from basics because it's always good to start from basics and not from the beginning. So I have the delight to work in two countries in among Europe and Greece and Slovakia or Slovakia and Greece. For me, I consider both of my countries. I have no disclosures. I would like to say uh, in a memorable of a huge professor, Professor Hugo Pars, who passed away this month, Delightly, he says a big, uh, a big motto. The main obstacle for better also here is the community is not the lack of the good material, but the lack of the information and the training of the medical staff and the patient to not use the existing materials properly. This was a great talk from Mr. Hugo Bats with a lot of things. And starting from the basics, always we should consider that the clinical uh, practical guidelines is from the American Veterans Forum. Polish and uh, the International Union of Phlebology also consider 
is in the patient with leg ulcer, we recommend compression therapy over the non compression therapy and the valence leg ulcer rate. If we are using compression therapy, has uh, are rated in the one degree and has levitas and B. Of course, Professor Holzer speak about the type of ulcer, but always have to mention that the 70% of the ulcer are venous insufficiency ulcer. And of course, as we increase the rates, we see people with, uh, with ulcers than, you know, as the ESCO study proof, of course, we don't have well, got the post robotic also mixed ulcer, arterial and venous, uh, arterial, which contraindication for compression therapy, diabetic ulcer, vascularitis, cancer related or other etiology. So going on to Professor Fett, always we have to ask ourselves, why it happened this and Professor Fetto make it easy. She had it a uh, beautiful algorithm presented in his uh, and published in medicine of biology journal medicine about patient with wound and lower lip. Always we should speak about complete medical history of the ulcer history, detail, based on examination, in supreme and starting position, prescription signed and symptoms, instrumental test of venous or arterial disease with ultrasound examination biochemical molecular test of the inflammation. And of course, we have to classify the disease. And for that, we have to proceed to the treatment. Treatment is, as Professor say before, the primary exudate management, molecular analysis of the exudated, which is very important to see if the trauma is healing. And of course, don't forget, everything starts with here and stops here and just, and if it's not satisfied we are we, we are feeling it's because we don't have proper compression treatment proper compression is a gold standard multi-layer multi -layer elastic compression dressing are the most important and if we are failing we have to adjust again i think and now coming to the question which of compression material is suitable for the interest in, for waiting to for also treatment. Of course, we have to see the prequistic, uh, the required effectiveness or compression of thermodynamics is significant to be at 60 milligrams of, of uh, mercury. The compression material has to be classified in elastic and in elastic materials, and elastic materials is not available to achieve strong pressure in standing position when properly applied. In elastic material, it's a very high standing pressure and very strong pressure peaks during muscle exercise. So don't forget the muscle pump. And for this reason, elastic pads has a hemodynamic effect and able to reduce ambulatory vein hypertension. Of course, as you see, everybody knows the hypertension and the venous uh, pressure as getting or the, the pressure of the corpuscle is more high. Everybody knows the good and the old technique. I personally use uh, till today the, uh, as uh, the UNABUTS as a gold standard therapy because it has a great high pressure, 60 millimeters of an electric, but has a snake effect with a stiff compression, but has some difficulties. For example, like the wood curve manager, it's all technology, but it works in our countries. Of course, the newest technology, like as double, also double layer. And also, it's double air compression stocking. It's great because, as you see, you have one stocking, the other stocking can, uh, which are stiff, uh, that has 30 millimeters of uh, uh, pressure, can be go on. So, bigger can be is used. And the newest devices uh, adjust uh, circuit uh, uh, devices, like as cool flex or standard flex devices can be adjusted the compression as the marks are seen on the right and all they can be managed by these marks, marking system. As you see in our clinical practice, you see, this is the difficult cases. Everybody asks what I can should do with this guy, you know, huge lipedema with a ulcer or with a, this. So I'm putting a question, what I should use? Ulcerics or adjustable compression wrap. Both of them are, are proved they are very good in ulcer treatment, but what is the pros and what is the cons? Both of them, they are very they are very cost effective. They are very easy to apply to both of them, which is very good. But you have to consider that 
the uh, ulcer X is not adjustable. So in the older people who has a mixed uh, ulcer, we have to use the adjustable compression rod. Uh, but me as a surgeon, always I try to consider what I do with these patients. And uh, there are a lot of people asking me, uh, and a lot of doctors, because you know we are multiple speciality and all of the people are working together, what I should do with them. Uh, sometimes their choice is difficult. You can choose from sclerotherapy just to do the underwood or below the wood at the capillary bed of the uh, of the vein ulcer to do a crossectomy, to do IVLA or non-thermal techniques. We we see that, and Professor Giovanni Vasti he said that. It's all, all concluded there is not almost general agreement that compression sets are equally effective in the healing cursor, but they say the surgery are and the uh, surgery combined with compression therapy are get make better results. And now what's going on in our region? You see, this is uh, disgusting <laughs> and very common, but we see this is very, very challenging. Also, you see it's... Um, also with uh, lymphedema, edema, uh, uh, a terrible uh, exudate. And of course, we know that in our region, it's very, it's the people are having this because due to high prevalence, due to poor socioeconomic reason, longer studying hours, lack of training quality of mm -hmm. the and quality healthcare personnel, poor awareness of the disease, Poorer people are neglected for the most medical speciality, older people without treatment, and higher risk in the number of overweight. So these are considered one special name, which I usually like to use when we say Balkan ulcers. And going on to our experience. Of course, our experience is uh, treating most of them. We are we like to exclude of our group the atypical or typical results. We we say we select only the vein ulcers for the treatment. The other, the arterial, we refer, for, we refer for, as endovascular surgery or surgery. We do only the venous part here. So we, we what we do in three centers between uh, Bratislava, Thessaloniki, and Athens, we treat 25 uh, people with CYP6 active disease. The mean age was 65 years old. There are 14 women and 11 was men, 21. Vein ulcer was due to esophysis and four was due to post thrombotic etiology. All of them we were using as a therapeutic algorithm. We used first UNAS boot bandaging for two weeks, and the further one we just used double stocking ulcer kit or adjustable compression wraps. We succeeded closer of vein also 95%. Mean time was six to eight weeks, and the approach was multiple, so that some of them had it uh, surgery, and the after one had it um, sclerotherapy. In the wound bent to order to succeed the, the optimal result. Fail them, 5% of them will fail because there was post robotic the disease or beneath of that. And of course, 10 of them they come back with their carnage. So we need to think, uh, but we manage them again with the sclerotherapy and double layer compression stocking. This is some uh, good result. This is actually a difficult case. This is a case which uh, you have to remember. This is a case which has it. Uh, post thrombotic cases. Uh, it is, has it uh, thrombosis on, uh, on the common femoral vein and, uh, and, and obstruction of the iliofemoral, but somehow with the stiff compression, we managed to succeed. But the problem is this kind of people, we have to remember if the people coming again and they have recurrence, so we have to remind that uh, they need uh, deep venous recanalization. So we are planning this lady to do venous recanalization because the recurrence rate will be most high. And other one, it's how we treat most of our cases in Greece and Slovakia. It's cheap, but very effective. It's, uh, we always consider that to treat the underneath the bed ulcer. So foam sclerotherapy is one of the best things. What you should always keep as an option to the patient with the vein ulcers because the sclerotherapy under the wound bed is what is, can promote you the heal and can prevent you also from the recurrency. So this is another case with a great wound. We do form sclerotherapy and after that, how it perform. In the conclusion, 
The brain also seeps its disease always remaining solid due to complexity and severity of the pathology. Good investigation and proper diagnosis, medical history, duplex ultrasound, IBM index, all was considered as a, a tools to diagnostics. Multiple approaches can have better results and accelerate the healing of the process and the value of the treatment. Compression is the golden starter to treat and prevent the recurrence of the leg ulcer. Inelastic and adjust the compression wrap devices provide the efficacy of the treatment of the vein ulcers and always consider the first choice. A use of the correct strategy improves the cost effectiveness of the disease and improves the quality of the patients. Thank you very much. Excellent uh, presentation, Demetrius, and uh, fascinating cases. Uh, I, I would like first to get the impression of my co-moderator because I'm sure uh, there is a lot of uh, uh, of her expertise in wound management in UK and NHS. And you mentioned the double layer bandage, and I know NHS they have four layer bandage. So I'm very eager to hear the comment of Tracy and then our panelist, Tracy. Yeah, um, in the UK, we are sort of moving away now from many of the four layer systems into two layer. Um, okay. So we're talking a lot now about um, ulcer kits. There's um, a new initiative um, that's going uh, forward about um, trying to get a gold standard of care um, and trying to get patients into compression earlier than we have done previously. So they are looking, we're still looking at bandaging systems, but they tend to be two layer systems with a short stretch bandage. Okay. Um, certain cases are still using, we still use the four layer systems, but that will be on the individual patient um, and their case history. Um, so yeah, we, we are tending to move now towards a lot more of the, um, the sort of two layer systems, the short yeah. stretch system, and then the ulcer X kits as well. So, uh, sorry, the ulcer kits as well. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. Uh, excellent. Excellent. Very good. So, I would like to share opinion and uh, remark from my panelists. Uh, I think Professor Silozi was uh, raising his hand. Was this due to previous lecture? It was. It was for previous one, but we have a question okay. for, for. Yeah, please go uh, ahead. Um, we have a question about uh, what uh, his patient are looking after has been healed. Are they happy to wear a test stocking on? Because in here, Romania, after I've been healed, they say, okay, I'm back and normal. I've got no problem. Why should I wear, still wear a compression test stocking right then? So I'm just yeah. worried. I'm not worried. I'm wondering why, why, why just near, or it might be in the same in other countries. I mean, are they happy to wear that test stocking when they're standing, when they were going to work? Or because we just have a chance telling them that they need to wear just during the day. And then the chance is coming back, you know what I mean? But if during the night, they can take the test stocking off as well. So the question is, are they happy with wearing that test stocking or not? Oh, excellent. excellent. Yeah, excellent question. Thank you very much. Christian. Thank you. And, uh, I would like to say that. Firstly of all, we are managing venous disease. So first, when someone comes with C6 disease, needs to have a proper education, first of all. You have to say them what they are dealing for. They come to you with in the late stages of the disease, which is chronic evolutive. So definitely, as we know in our countries, is a lack of medical speciality management because people they don't know where to go. So somehow it's coming to you, and of course you have to stay them. You are the first of all, you have to cooperate with you because cooperation is the most key things to succeed the ultimate result. So. Of course, you have to say that this is a recurrent disease. So you should wear compression stocking. In, in my own patients, which are treating them, and then after I follow up, I always introduce a double layer stocking because it's uh, very easy to apply. So everybody has easy things to do. And they have uh, no word, nobody are complaining, most of them. But I see, of course, people who didn't wear the stockings, they have recanalization. Yes. In Greece, we have a problem because here is a hot country, and we see people that don't uh, they don't like to use stockings. But in comparing Slovakia, they like to use stockings. So, 
in Greece, yes, we are dealing with a lot of rec recurrences, but in Slovakia you have less because people are more disciplined. So it's also, it's a type of uh, behavior, which I see in my practice, which is changed between among two countries, you know, people somehow in uh, in Slovakia they are more disciplined, in Greece they are not disciplined, but somehow we manage. But don't forget the other devices, the cool flex devices, it's great. It's, it's made for the hot environments. The cool flex device you can put on the fridge. So we have succeed, especially in the uh, in the population who have or in the overweights and the people who are uh, have problem to wear in the hot because the cool flex is devices with technology they are not complaining with the hot even they're using the forty degrees. So education is the first. When it's come or come to you, the vein ulcer. You have to say them what they are dealing for and what is the perspectives. And of course, you have to say them when you have the smallest wound, please refer to us back because you know you don't want to go back in the same way it was before years. Yeah. And this is my this is always we are dealing in the worst case scenario. Sip sick disease is, is a terrible. So if you manage them to somehow to close or you manage to close the wound, always it has to be close to you. Yeah. This is Excellent. the pathway of the of the treatment. There is no other yeah. way. You should wear compression stocking. That's it. And you should change that. It's very important. Every six yeah. months. Because without compression stocking change every month, there is no lifetime guarantee. Excellent. Excellent. That's that's very important, really, because this is a very common problem that after the ulcer is healed, they take the stock off and then you get recurrent. So Please, we need to tell our patient to keep the stocking. So, any other question from our dear panelist, uh, Gregor Holzer? Do you have any question in mind? Yes, I have a question for the sclerotherapy of the ulcer. Because you said yeah. you make sclerotherapy of the ulcer bed. Are you looking for perforating veins close to the ulcer? Or are you just, in many cases, injecting? Or where, where do you inject the sclerosing agent? And okay. um, are you using also a toxic sterile? Okay. Okay, that's uh, a great question, Dimitris. Uh, like, uh, okay, I use first of all to ask the second part. We use uh, uh, both of them, uh, or well-known detergents, atosisclerol and ACS. Okay, mm -hmm. ACS and atosisclerol. It depends, of course, with the low concentration. We or from the diameter of the vein, we choose the correct concentration. Which is very important. Of course, don't forget the foam sclerotherapy has a great power. Now, going to the point of where to treat rather than the perforates. Of course, the the, our, the uppermost and the lowermost part of the venous is what we should treat is the capillary bed, the bed beneath of the the, the bed with bed. So top and uh, above, and of course, if there is perforators, you should close. But it's very difficult this time when you have a big perforator to close. When it's to till to three millimeters, you can close sufficient with uh, foam sclerotherapy. Nowadays, we use a new the, the, the technique, the glue technique, the, the, the glue technique from uh, to close the perforators, so which uh, approved more sufficiency in combined with foam sclerotherapy. And it proves great results. So we have a lot of tools right now. We don't. We, don't, we now we are ongoing investigation some in the way to see whether rather than but the, these techniques seems more. Now Professor Tesari is going to show some results about this uh, uh, hybrid technique. Let's say, but of course, don't forget. It's not only the bad ulcers. It's the to uh, to the means the veins to surfaces, so, so tranquilar veins, small saphenous veins. Don't forget, mostly of the people, uh, we forgot that we have small saphenous vein. Oh, everybody has treating the great saphenous vein. Small saphenous vein can be the biggest problem. The recurrence can be the biggest problem of the vein. So always we should do. When is the failing strategy? We should start, start beginning from the basics, ultrasound, and again, uh, ultrasound, and again, see what is going on. Because it's 100% something going wrong with the technical thing. Ultrasound is always the answer. Rather, it's a 
arterial, whether it's a venous or there is a venolymphatic lymphoedema, always use good. And don't forget compression. Compression is the most important thing to have technical success in sclerotherapy, post-sclerotherapy yeah. without, yeah. so without compression. Yes. It's not, so it's not possible. Yeah, that's an excellent, excellent advice. Uh, compression is so crucial in dealing with this patient. I was informed that we have a couple of hundred viewers on LinkedIn and another couple of hundred on Facebook as well, uh, which is, is uh, I'm very happy yeah. that we are sharing this European experience with the cutting edge uh, a specialist, how they deal with this problem. I will share with you, hoping to get a, a quick answer some of the questions that we got from uh, our attendee. The first question uh, directed to you, what about ischemia? Is it contraindicated to apply compression when you have an ischemia? Again, this is an important question. So what okay. is your answer, Dimitris? Okay, as a vascular surgeon, because I'm a vascular yeah. surgeon, we go firstly yeah. from the basics. In uh, yeah. They think this is what we will do. In uh, also we will do angiobrachial indexes. Yeah. Angiobrachial index mesomery is the basics before starting to treat whatever it is, before okay. ultrasound, before this. So if this below 60 millimeters of mercury, it's a contraindication. It's totally yeah. contraindication. We should never use compression therapy under 60 millimeters in any case, because or you can use light. You can use, for example, first compression cases. Uh, it's, when is the, it's the edge? But definitely never after this. You have to treat first the arteries, and then yeah. you should do the vein. This is the algorithm I should do: our inflow, arterial inflow, and then yeah. you yeah. do the arterial flow. But of course, we know we have a lot of uh, lot of challenges. Lot of challenges. Yeah. Mixed yeah. services yeah. keep coming all day. You know, as the age is progressing and the people are not treated. Yeah. And uh, okay. for example, one very typical thing is diabetic cultures, which also have a problem with uh, venous disease. Yeah. Okay. I will just take uh, last question before going to Tracy. There is a question here came. Uh, what about deep venous reconstruction, LU femoral, uh, uh, and which dedicated stent to use? I think he's speaking about LU femoral occlusion okay. as a cause of venous ulcer. Um, okay. Do you treat it, and what is your preferred venous stent? Uh, okay, first of all, we we like to to uh, of course first thing is going first. Who to treat or how to not to treat is a whole process. For example, a good ultrasound again is the answer. When they have a problem with the inflow arteries because the, the inflow veins, it's uh, yeah. always a challenge uh, to treat because, for example, we have a close profunda close yeah. uh, external and close common uh, common uh, iliac common artery this yeah. and uh, in these cases it's a very is when it's not going to going to have any inflow it's not going to last the stand so this is a really really challenging cases i know my my tutor uh, professor Jalil, uh, Jalil from uh, Aken and from Maastricht, he's uh, tried to put some kind of increased inflow, but this is the biggest challenges. If in these cases we will do, we use most of the time, uh, the, uh, the, um, and we use the stent from uh, from, from the Neutronic, the upper stent in our ways. Okay. But uh, I say you, we have to always to think that which classification we're gonna treat. Yeah. Because uh, uh, the deep venous insufficiency in the, in the fourth stage of uh, deep venous occlusion, it's a uh, very challenge still. So sometimes it's better to, to keep them in the compression. And if they have great without a score, pain scale or deteriorate too much, then to choose because it's uh, really, really challenging. In, in, in the third and two or one, it's not a problem always, but usually the fourth, uh, uh, the fourth case, the fourth, uh, the fourth, presentation of the case is what is the most common also have a like answer. Okay, thank you very much, Dimitris. And now my co-moderator uh, to uh, give us our next poll, uh, Tracy. Okay, thank you, Professor Omar. Uh, so the next question is, what is the recommended duration for wearing compression stockings per day? So would you think that it should be six to eight hours? 
12 to 16 hours or 18 to 24 hours? I think we might have a few mixed answers here. Um, so yeah, let's see what everybody thinks on this question. I'm very eager to to see how how Me much too. of the <laughs> answer, yeah. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. And thank you very much for the very nice remark about the two layer bandage, uh, the change in NHS from four layer to two layer compression bandage, which yeah. uh, really very nice information to share with everyone. Thank you. Back to the old basics, as I also I mentioned there, because you know. Yeah. The problem, the point of that, I don't know, Tracy. You know, in a, in our countries, what we are dealing with that is a low because I also am a training nurses. Uh, I don't know how you. I, I like a tip for you how the nurses are reacting to the wounds. You know, because you know, wound nurses are wound nurses, but generally the population. How you train them to get out the phobia because mostly of them they're afraid of the yeah. of the leg. And you know the beginning of that. You know everybody that are scared. How you treat them? The psychological way. I like a thing, yeah. a thing yeah. from you. Yes. Yeah. Excellent. A... Oh, fantastic! Ooh, well, I said I said we'd have a few different um, answers here, didn't I? Right. Yeah. Okay. Interesting. So we've got twenty nine percent saying six to eight hours. Um, so I would think maybe people are thinking there about during working hours possibly um 12 to 16 hours so maybe from waking to going to bed again another possibility removing at night time and 18 to 24 so i'm interested to see if any of our panelists want to maybe have a, a talk about that because i do know that obviously when we've got patients in ulcer kits some patients may remove the top stocking at night for comfort others may wear it yeah, All the time. I, I will again, I invite uh, our, our dear panelist Luca Gazabin if he'd like to uh, to put his feedback. Professor Luca Gazabin or any of the panelists want to uh, to share his opinion, yes. we can just speak straight away. Oh, here he is. Okay, hey. welcome, <laughs> Omar. So I yeah. think it's important to to look also at the patient and the habits, daily habits, how which is the work, how many times they, they are standing, okay? So uh, patients suffering from ulcers, is better more time they uh, wear the stocking and more is, is good for me. Okay, so you don't have a fixed hour plan, you tell your patient, but no. the more the severe the disease, the more you ask him to wear a stocking. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, excellent. Uh, any of the panelists who would like to add? To this I point, it's always the question: What is doable for the patient? You know, sometimes I think if you tell him you have to wear compression stockings all day long, it's it's more horrific for them. Otherwise, when you say, "Okay, please at least eight hours per day when you're standing, wear those," and if this is a compromise which you can take, I'm I'm happy to do this. Take this compromise, you know. Excellent, excellent. That's another nice approach as well. And okay, and yes, please. And Dimitris. one comment. When we are dealing with vein ulcers in patients, yeah. always also remember that the vein ulcer also should take some air because you have yeah. pseudomonas. So, <laughs> for example, you should uh, keep that in mind. Yeah. Somewhere also could help the, the wound to, to do healing. So, yeah, that's an I, important thing too. Yeah. Okay. Let what, me, uh, uh, yeah. Excellent. One, one yes. Yes, please. What we do in here in Romania, as we have yes. gone with our patient to to wear that test stocking. First of all, me personal, I'm wearing a test stocking during the work. I just show them. Look at me. I've got one on my legs now. Now, so they. Oh, you can do that one. Yes, I can do that one. And uh, yeah, sure, man. And uh, the other thing is very important. I'm just telling them if they during the day they go break for 20, 15, and they put the legs up somewhere on the bed and relaxing, they can take them off, right? It will yeah. be more mentally helping them to say, I'm not wearing test talking 12 hours, 14 hours. It's just a break. And then they go there, oh yeah, I feel now my feet is up. I can take them off and everything is right. But when it's back to work, when when it's back to do something, when the feet is tanned, definitely they can have it. 
yeah sure excellent uh, that's a very nice point do, yeah. do you advise nursing who stand up long time to wear a stocking as a prophylaxis do, do exactly this, do as a this prophylaxis is? this is what i'm doing since i was 26 now i'm 41 i'm not saying you look just like this. i've been wearing since i was 26 just because standing all day using my mind okay. my mouth and my arms but never my legs so heavy Excellent. heavy feet painful the vein are getting larger and larger and the chris just told me cat it's your time now that stocking take them and i did and now amazing one. excellent excellent that's, that's uh amazing. Yeah, that's an excellent advice. And you still yeah. look 26 and more and more, <laughs> more, more, more nurses. My colleagues, all of them are yeah. most of them are working here and uh, they are wearing that stocking. Yeah. Prophylactic one. Definitely. Yeah. I think government, I'm not sure uh, Tracy can help us. Does government give uh, prophylactic stocking to nursing in UK? Is this one of your? It's no, not. No, no, not but no. the government <laughs> are doing a great job in UK. Tracy knows that, and I was because I was there with the uh, with the pregnant ladies. They're wearing a prophylactic tat stocking. I've seen that when I was there in England. Definitely they do. Sorry, okay. Tracy, you go on. No, no, just um, the NHS will don't provide to to the nurses. No, um, most definitely not. We advise. Yeah, you do. But, yeah, um, yeah, they'd have to get them themselves. Yeah. 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 <laughs> Unfortunately. Excellent. Excellent. Uh, I'm very happy and eager to present the next speaker from Italy, his dear friend, uh, uh, Luca Gazabin. He is a surgeon with a specific expertise in philippology and lymphology. He involved in a lot of complex vascular surgery, specially dedicated to ulcer treatment. Actually, he was very busy today doing three major list of venous intervention. We, we just grabbed him before taking lunch to present to us, which we Thank are you. very grateful to. And he's also a diabetic foot surgeon. He's a member of the Italian uh, College of Philippology, which is very well known all over Europe. And uh, he's also uh, head of the Italian Youth Committee of International Union of Angiology. He's a professor at the University of Digli Studio di Napoli. I hope I pronounce it well. Mm -hmm. and, um, and we're very eager to hear what do you do for venous ulcer in Italy. Please go ahead. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, it's a, a great honor for me. Uh, to participate in this webinar and uh, many compliments to all the panelists and the levels of the presentation are very, very high. So I start. Okay, so uh, I'd like first, I'd like to talk to you about the uh, chronic venous disease and the CAP classification looking the clinical aspects and the pathophysiology. Uh, here you can see the evolution of the, of the disease through the various stages, arriving to C6 uh, symptomatic stage in which we will have the uh, active ulceration. And looking at the pathophysiology, uh, you can see how genetic and environmental factors alterated the shear stress on the vein wall. So we will have the uh, an enhancing of the inflammatory process and a lesion of the glycocalyx of the endothelium. Uh, this leads to the uh, activation of the inflammatory cells and the NM, an increase, uh, a lot of inc more increases of um, MMP, uh, more than nine MMP, uh, arriving to dermal skill changes. So how can we assess a patient suffering from a vascular ulcers? Uh, I have, I show you the uh, UMA position document, the European Wood Management Association, uh, with a sort of flowchart. We will start from the as from a diagnostic assessment of the patient and going on with a clinical ulcer evaluation. And very important is the wound bed preparation. We must prepare the, the, the lesion to restart the healing process. And it's very important the control of bacterial burden 
or infection, depends on uh, which is the, the condition of the ulcer, using uh, wound healing dressing, specific uh, wound dressing, or reconstructive or regenerative surgery. Compression therapy is mandatory and always, uh, always present in all my cases. So, which are the main effects of compression therapy? Uh, venous pump and lymphatic vessels, we have an improvement, functional improvement of stasis and blood reflux, improves edema drainage from the interstitium, and very, very important, removes the inflammatory molecules from the interstitium, which are uh, important for the uh, healing of the ulcers and the reduction also for the pain. In the arterial flow, the edema reduction improves the microcirculation and speed up blood flow and gets a better tissue oxygenation. So at the end, we will have a volumetric limb reduction and increased arteriovenous blood flow, both in the, in the macro circulation or in the micro circulation, uh, and a great reduction of the uh, subcutaneous edema. Here I show you two papers, and one is uh, talk about one of the questions before. Uh, this is a paper from Giovanni Mosti, an Italian phlebologist. Uh, which works a lot with uh, Hugo Parsh. And uh, here you can see how compression therapy can be used in mixed ulcers. So you, we can compress uh, also in patients suffering from PAD, okay? There, there are a cutoff and you, you can see how um, uh, compression lead to a normalization of a highly reduced venous pumping and inelastic compression is recommended, okay? More from 30 to 40 millimeters of mercury. Uh, in this Cochrane review, uh, this is very important because uh, here you, we can, we can do, we can stay they say that uh, com to compress is better than no compress, okay? So when we treat a vascular ulcer, uh, it's better to apply a compression therapy. And uh, another, another evidence is that patient receiving four layer bandage, okay? So a, a system or a complex bandage is better than a single layer bandage. And talking about, instead of talking about uh, uh, stockings, uh, it's very important to, to use a high compression stocking. So let's start from my first clinical case. I, uh, I show you, I show you uh, various uh, cases. Uh, this is a patient suffering from chronic venous disease, chronic venous ulcers, and a post-thrombotic syndrome. You can see the pigmentation of the leg and the position, the typical position of the ulcer. He had a bilateral ulcer. This is the evaluation, the first evaluation. Here you can see the ultrasound evaluation with a great saphenous vase incompetency. You can see the diameters of the GSV is like the common femoral vein. And it's very um, important to look at the edema, okay? The suprafascial edema. So uh, subcutaneous, uh, which is very important uh, to reduce to obtain the healing of the, of the ulcer. In this patient, I've had uh, another um, new device, this device, uh, which is um, very useful to detect the presence of bacteria into the wounds. This, this device detects the presence of bacteria with a concentration of more than 10 to four colony forming unit by fluorescence. Uh, highlighting them with a violet excitation like light. And um, he analyzes the intrinsic fluorescence signal emitted by the porphyrins present in the bacteria. So uh, uh, you, can, you can understand also uh, quickly 
uh, how um, how is the contamination and the bacterial border of the of the wound and uh, you can also it guides you with the to the bride to in the debridement okay and uh, this device had or has also a software which you can with, with that you can uh, detect the area of the lesion and uh, look at, at uh, all, all the visits in this patient I have not used the bandage, but I've used a compression wrap and for the medication, a iodine based antiseptic dressing. Uh, this patient works a lot, a lot, a lot, and uh, she, he is always uh, standing. So for him, it was very useful to wear a compression wrap. And here you can see the, the ulcer is almost healed and uh, the, the skin changes, which is better. Now I, I want to see you, uh, to show you this patient with a chronic venous ulcer and uh, a massive subcutaneous calcification is very particular case, this. And uh, uh, at the X-rays, you can see this, uh, this calcification. This patient was uh, candidate, candidate for limb amputation. We have done uh, several uh, deep debridement in the operatory room and uh, multiple autologous and uh, homologous kidney graft until we, we have reached the, the healing. And the other clinical case is a mixed ulcer. Uh, in this patient, uh, we we have we had a GSV incompetency, so a CVD probe disease and a PAD uh, with the, uh, occlusion of the superficial uh, femoral artery, not complete occlusion. And uh, in this type of wound, we can, we observe no granulation tissue, a sclerotic wound bed. This wound is very difficult to 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 restart. And so uh, we need an, um, a, a deep debridement. And uh, after we will co we had covered with uh, an homologous skin graft. Instead, in this clinical case, another patient suffering from a venous post-thrombotic ulcer, we have had debridement and an autologous skin graft. We have a good result. One month, uh, we have healed this ulcer. And uh, this patient was always um, bandaged. At the end, uh, this is a very, very important case. And in this case, you can see the consequences of a massive vasculitis, okay? Uh, another patient candidated to limb amputation. Uh, very difficult cane. It requests uh, a lot of surgery and a lot of uh, amounts to heal. Uh, it's important to underline that in this patient, compression therapy is very, very important to, to control the exudation and to control also the, the dressing. At, at the end, when you, when you have a massive damage of the vessel and of the lymphatic vessels, uh, you have an edema of the leg. So this patient is, um, must wear a compression stocking and in this case, we she she wear a class one below the knee stocking. You can see also the the tools. Um, here I want to show you this book because uh, this is an Italian consensus document in two thousand and eighteen, uh, with my scientific society. Uh, we have. Uh, done the indications in various fields of medicine and, and surgery. And I was very honored, honored to write the chapter dealing with the compression therapy and wound healing. Um, I want to, to underline two uh, important aspects of the compression therapy. Uh, one is the correct application of the, of the bandage. This is some example like figures and, uh, and photos. 
multi-layer bandage is always done in our in our ambulatory uh, with different bandages and from different uh, type. Here I want to show you some mistakes. Okay, uh, many patients uh, arriving in my ambulatory with this type of uh, of bandage. Uh, Vascular ulcer, uh, vascular ulcers can't heal with this type of bandage. So, so it's very, very important to apply a good compression. And the second aspect that I want to underline is this, uh, that when you use elastic stocking in, um, to treat vascular ulcers, it's very important, the stiffness concept uh, you must use uh, high stiffness materials in wound healing because are more effective in improving uh, venous pump, okay? So you must use compression stocking uh, done with rubber and the class uh, at the right of this slide, you can see how the increase of the depression uh, with the glass stuff stocking. So it's very important to use high stiffening materials. Here you have an example of a patient uh, who had a venous ulcer now healed. Uh, this patient wears wrong, uh, wrong uh, stockings. You can see a circular uh, trauma. Uh, I, I suggest uh, here to wear a different stocking, in this case, a, a VRAC compression device, because it is more useful for your for her leg. Okay, and you can see the pictures. Uh, very useful. The patient can adjust the, the stocking by herself and applying the compression that I suggest her. And uh, in the final in the final picture, you can see. In the right leg, the compression valve, and in the left leg, a bandage. So I can compare the efficacy and the comfort uh, of this type of compression therapy. So thank you for your attention. Uh, excellent. That's uh, that's a great presentation. The great uh, evidence-based uh, practice, uh, great involvement, and I'm sure it will trigger. A lot of questions. Uh, let me start by my co-moderator. If you have any question, and then we'll go to panelists and attendee. Okay. Thank you. Welcome. Tracy, do you have a question? Um, no, I don't actually. I, I think oh, that was very okay. clear. Thank you. Yes. <laughs> okay. Uh, any, any of our uh, great uh, panelists have a question? Uh, Gregor or Demetrius yeah. or... I can, yes. can say another another thing about the the compression therapy in the uh, ischemic patients. So uh, is the compression is not uh, you can compress. It's very important to measure the ABI index. So yeah. uh, over zero point five, you can compress with an inelastic uh, bandage. Okay, Which but below point five, you would tolerable. Uh, yeah. Okay. Uh, I, have, I have a question. Yeah, yeah please go ahead, uh, Professor Lucas. Thank you. Congratulations. Excellent, excellent uh, details. Uh, consider the skin grafts you use too much to close this. Uh, this, of course, I I saw you use a lot of technology, especially for the bed wound. You with this. Uh, devices you control the bed wound or for the bacteria. Mm -hmm. So as we know, we're never gonna have a clear answer at all. This is not possible. which bacteria you accept in order to the skin graft to be sufficiently uh, accepted from the from the uh, to be accepted the uh, to be accept the apologous skin graft. So do you accept some bacteria or it has to be total clean of the bacteria? of uh, the also before you use a skin graft. Okay. Graph. So I use two type of skin grafts, uh, as you can see, uh, homologous and autologous. Homologous I, I keep from the dermal bank, okay? And um, 
Well, if you if you do a very deep and important debridement, uh, you remove um, a lot of uh, biofilm and uh, tissue, okay, and chronic tissue. So uh, if you have a, a an infected an infected um, ulcer, is 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 very important to reduce the the bacterial burden. Uh, before doing surgery, okay? But if you have a normally colonized, okay, uh, ulcer, you can do the surgery and uh, remove uh, more tissue. It's very important to remove a lot of tissue and arrive into the fascia, okay? Okay. Okay, the rebridement is very, very, very important. And uh, we use also um, pulsatile washing device. Uh, it's like a, it's like a gun, which uh, with with water, and we wash a lot the 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 wound after the debridement, and then we will apply we apply uh, the skin graft. But the material burden is very important. Yes, not too much. And the second okay. question: How do you manage the exudate from the skin graft? You apply a, a negative pressure device on top or you sometimes are, sometimes mm. because the exudation after that maybe it's a, the failure of the skin graft because when it's gonna cut yeah, some yeah, yeah, so yeah. the monadas so we we done it that's it mm, so, yes yes uh, negative pressure mm, sometimes uh does a lot of um humidity i don't know yeah. uh water loss okay so and are a more more aggressive on the on the graft so you you must be not too much uh powerful with the millimeters okay. of mercury okay so and with, it... yeah and with the goals not with the um, not with the other filler okay yeah. You use the, the, the white spawn or you use the gray yeah, spawn? Yeah, yeah, yeah. The, the white, white spawn on the so graft. So you are flushing all, uh, every day the the, the graft with uh, the serine solution. You wash the wash. Yeah, yeah, you wash yeah. out the 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 the, mm. the, the, the pump. Okay. Yes, but the negative pressure in the in the smaller cases. Okay. Uh, is you prefer to ring with a fluoridic sign or just a bandage? A... And bandage and uh, your dying goes. Okay, so you use aggressive okay. iodine and that's it. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Excellent. Any other question from my dear panelist? Okay, I have a couple of questions from the attendee. Very important question. First one from Dr. Magnish Tarti. He said, what is your opinion to apply silver stream solution to wash the wound, then apply a silver nanocrystal gel uh, on ointment having proteolytic enzyme. So uh, he's speaking about silver as an antiviral, antibacterial, followed by enzymatic degradation or what is called the chemical debridement. Do you have any experience to add to this question? Oh, uh, chemical degradement, I, I have done one time, is um, with an acid, yeah, I think. Uh, this acid uh, attacked the, the, the tissue uh, and uh, provoke a necrosis of the yeah. tissue. That, yeah, yeah, I've done one or two cases. And uh, two small, small, uh, small experience for me. But yeah. uh, when I have removed the, the necrosis, uh, yeah. In, so, yeah. Uh, we will arrive in, at the fascia. So it was very, very strong yeah. for me. Yeah, yeah. yeah. He, but he, the pain, he, I remember the pain yeah. was very, very much. So you can do always in the operatory room, yeah. in my opinion, yeah. not in the ambulatory, yeah. in my opinion. Yeah, yeah. You know, that there are different modalities to remove necrotic tissue from venous ulcer. One of them, which is really very strange, but it is done in NHS, is to put maggots small okay. on the wound uh i have seen it once in my life it works well but it is terrifying really really well. <laughs> we 
we uh, also do it. So we, we have experience with we that. We also do it. Yes. Okay. And it, the funny thing Absolutely. is, yes, the, the patients tolerate it quite well and it doesn't work yes. and it works well. It's just the idea for everyone involved who has to get used to it. Maggots, yeah. maggots are amazing. I've seen for the first time when I was in UK. Yeah, it's amazing. Yeah. They're doing a great job. You can't believe that one. The granulation is growing, is growing up easily. You can't believe that one. The wound exactly. is black. Next day, the wound is red. Can you believe that? No. Yeah. We need Absolutely, this. yeah. They, they just remove pus, remove necrotic tissue, and they enhance healing. Yeah. But uh, uh, anyway, it's just enumerating how many things we have. So the second question, the last question from attendee uh, uh, to uh, Luca is could compression therapy impede blood supply of an ulcer to delay the healing? I think you already answered this question, but you just need to enumerate. Are you worried about blood supply when you do compression? Actually improve healing if it is due to venous hypertension. Yeah, yeah. compression improves the, the venous uh, reflux. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And I, 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 um, I am seeing uh, another question when it uh, be more than 0 0.5 should be in elastic compression we must yes. use yeah in yes case it is. that's what you said yes very important because inelastic is well tolerated in the rest position okay yeah. works in when the patient uh, work yeah. in elastic bandage Excellent. A lot of attendees said an excellent presentation and we thank you very much and I thank you very much as well. And uh, I will go to my uh, co-moderator, uh, Tracy, for the next poll. Thank you, Omar. Thank you very much. OK, so the next poll question is, which of the following is a common symptom for venous ulcers? So is it intermittent claudication, rest pain or edema? See what we get from this question. I did like the machine, which show you how much bacterial load you got in your wound. I hope it is not that expensive. Uh, yes, it, it's in, expensive. In fact, it's, it's not mine. It's borrowed. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> not mine. <laughs> Uh, but yeah. uh, going back to Gregor, because I know that Gregor, you will speak about uh, maggots, and I know in Vienna there is. Uh, uh, do you see something more in this kind of deprimed? Because this is really fascinating. We use some in Bratislava, yeah. in maggot therapy, we know that. But we, you saw us the technology how to do that. But do you see something? Some effective of this kind of uh, deprimed? Because we know that all the deprimings are not so good, like as this uh, uh, this hungry creatures. Do you post something? Do you see some benefits? Because you know this is the most important thing in the wound bed, the the cleaning. So, do you find something more interesting to talk about the maggot therapy from wound bed? Because I know you 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 use a lot. Yes. Um. You mean. As, as, what's what's the specific question? If you, Do you if, find some acceleration when you use oh, yes, yes. Um, in, in 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 contrary with the other kind of deprimence yeah. in the in the vein in the ulcer healing? I think where I can make a judgment is where normally if you have a patient hospitalized and he has like big ulcers and you make mechanical debridement every day, you know the one which you lose do under local anesthesia as compared mm -hmm. to maggots. Um it's much quicker with the maggots and it's also the patients yeah. much preferred much more because they don't have the pain, the daily routine of the physical pain going through the deep treatment, even with the local anesthesia, you know, it's, they always feel something and they hate it. And with the maggots, it's, you just have to check every day if the maggots are still alive and the growing and eating, and then you leave them in, in place. Um, and I find it's, it's a good alternative um, for, for um, for uh, for mechanical debridement, debridement. I mean, we also use the enzymatic debridement, um, but as compared to everything which you can put on in a conservative setting, I think the maggots are, I think, the most effective. Yes. Yeah. Okay, I think we got the answer. We've got quite a mixed picture. Um, so we've got 13% saying intermittent claudication 
and 18% saying rest pain, um, 70% saying edema. Now, I think really, I think everybody will, and, and you, Omar, will agree with me as well here that the intermittent claudication, the rest pain are more suggestive of your arterial ulcers rather than um, a venous ulcer. And that's what we were sort of asking. So the actual question, answer was edema. Um, and, you know, I think if we think about how the venous system works and the, the edema that we get with venous ulcers, that's sort of where we were coming from. But more in general, intermittent claudication, rest pain tend to be or are significant of your um, arterial um, insufficiency. Excellent. Excellent. OK, we, we've got a few few questions, really, which oh, are important from the attendee. <laughs> yes, but uh, I promise them that we will send them the answer directly to their email. And just because of time, we kept one of the best lecture until the end, which will be uh, presented from Romania. Uh, we're all fascinated to listen to their experience. It will be a double presentation uh, by uh, Christian Silozi and Dr. Catalan uh, Vakiulescu, and let me present them. Uh, professor Silozi uh, is Associate Professor in General and Vascular Surgery. His area of competence is Oncology Surgery, Laparoscopic Surgery, Health Care Management, General Ultrasonography. Uh, he moved from multiple universities, uh, um, among them University of Bordeaux in France and University of Cariova. Uh, the, the, um, uh, the second presenter with him over the next presentation is Catalan uh, Vakulescu. Uh, he looked to, still 26, he's 26 of age. He hasn't changed. I wish, um, I wish. <laughs> no, it's true. It, it looks, Zoom doesn't lie. And he's from Romania. And he's a staff nurse, but you can see he's very, very involved with, in dealing with patients. And I have learned a lot from uh, nurses dealing with venous, uh, venous pathology. Um, he interacts a lot with uh, vascular surgery nursing, with ICU, with, uh, with anesthetic nursing. He's also um, uh, work in private hospital in Cariova. He also did work for three years in NHS in Hull and East Yorkshire Hospital, where he held the position of faculty of physical education and the sport uh, in University of Cariova, Romania. Eagerly to uh, listen to your great uh, last presentation. Right. Thank you. Thank you very much for uh, your presentation. Uh, we are a team. We uh, are looking after uh, chronic wound care. Uh, and uh, we are working with uh, Dr. Alexandra Andritsoyu also, uh, who is a medical echographist. And uh, uh, I will uh, put the presentation, but share screen. And uh, you can see uh, something. Can you see? Yes, you can. Uh, you need presenter mode. That is great. Okay. Um, uh, we work uh, in a team and um, we have uh, another colleague, uh, Dr. Alexandra Andritsoyu, who is a medical uh, echographist and uh, uh, also, Katalin Wojkulescu, who is a staff, uh, staff uh, nurse, who is right near uh, with me, and uh, will uh, present the slides. Right then. So, uh, my name is Katalin, but everybody call me Kat. So, if you want, just call me Kat, please. I'm a staff nurse. I'm a doctor. And uh, I've been working, as you said, in general, ICU and uh, uh, vascular surgery. But since I study job, I can say that I love the chronic wounds. As Chris said, our surgeon, vascular surgeon, we've got Timmy here, a medical vascular center, and we really do everybody what it have to do. So he's the surgeon, we've got an echographist, and I'm the nurse looking after properly chronic wounds. What exactly means a chronic wounds? means a diabetic foot, arterial ulcer, a vein ulcer that we're going to speak again to, uh, right now, vasculitis ulcer, and so on. 
Right. So which are the most common characteristics of uh, venous ulcer? Everybody knows them. them. That is a wound. There's a part of the calf. Uh, it might be an active or a chronic wound all the time. What is our purpose? We must heal it. Definitely, we have to do that one. Um, what exactly means a vein ulcer? As you probably know, but I want to say that one, the vein ulcer is not a disease. Is the effect of a disease who is called vein failure or vein insufficiency. So most of them are be done and are the risk on infection. Definitely they are. Most of 90% of vein ulcer, they are infected. There is a risk of amputation when you've got a vein ulcer. No, it's not. Since I've been doing this job, I've never ever seen an amputation due to a leg ulcer. Why? I'm gonna show you next. Right. So uh, which are the most common risks on a vein uh, ulcer? They are indirect one that there means a family inheritance, but we've got a direct one, which are more important. So I would like to highlight three of them, varicose vein, D-vein thrombosis, and obesity. They are most common and most worthful when you've got a wound, a vein also in your uh, lower limb. Uh, what else I would like to say about that one? I would like to, to make a comparison before and after pandemic time, before and during pandemic time. Why I'm saying that? Because the um, conservative management was a successful one. Why I'm saying that? If you want to manage a vein also, definitely got two points. One, it's a surgical management who's been done by the surge one, by the comp Conservative one is based on three po points very important. First of all, compressing therapy. After healing, the patient needs to wear touch stockings. During the healing time, you need to have a look on your wound who might be or not infected. And of course, choosing the right dressing that you need to apply during the healing process. But uh, as a part of the healing process, before me as a staff nurse start to looking after that wound, I need to make sure that the patient has been seen by an echographist. And you can see on this picture, you have an echo Doppler and a platysmography that is showing me what? It's showing me that that patient, he's got pulse on his foot because as we talked about that earlier, you make me very carefully to apply a compression dressing if he's got other com comorbidities like arterial problem, diabetes problem. As you know, diabetes is doing to the uh, lower limb and the forefoot, uh, neuropathy and angiopathy. So please don't start addressing our compression dressing without patient being seen by an echographist. Why I'm saying that, look at this case, look at this case, he's got a reflux on the deep uh, system and also in uh, superficial system one. So make sure don't start addressing without having an echographist. Uh, what's the most important results for a vein ulcer? Reduce the pain, reduce the swollen, reduce the pigmentation that is always present on the leg ulcer, of the vein ulcer, and uh, of course, after healing, prevent recurrences. This is the most important. Just make an education with your patient, explain them, involve the family in your what healing process when the patient is at home. You don't know if he's wearing the dressings on, you don't know if he listen to you what to do, and make sure the family is there with him and make sure he is listening to you definitely. What are the benefits and what is the things that most important? I mean, apart from the dressing time is the medication. And this is the Chris job, of course, not mine, but they are helping with what? With uh, venue active drugs on the path, and the other one reducing the reflux in the vein and being able for the affected vein to push the blood blood to the to the heart 
and reduce the swollen, the edema, reduce the leakage and the process of healing. It's a very helpful stuff. Right, we are in a pandemic time. Do you remember what happened there? All the guidelines, right? Everything call up, everything going down. So we're still working on a conservative dressings, on a conservative management of a chronic wounds. Why? Because we didn't have access to the theater. We didn't have access to the medical stuff in order to do a surgery or stuff like this. And still over there, as I will show you in the next slides, things went very, very well. So what was the point during this three years when you got that problem with the medical system? Of course, medical drugs, Chris, echographies, Dr. Andri Tsoyu, and of course, compression dressings done by the nurse in the nursing lab. One another point, just think about, did you have this chance that anybody call you and to say, what are gonna do now? I'm not coming to the next week. I can't come to see, I can't come to change the dressings. What can I do there? And what we did, we just involved in a remote management of venous also. What exactly we did, we did apply a telemedicine platform. And with for that one, we can keep any time the contact with our patients. And now let's start the job. Which job? Nursing job in a vascular specialist lab. What we've got here are leg ulcer. You can see in the, in the calf, you've got the pigmentation on. It's the first time when it's, it came to, the, to our lab. Uh, it's a swollen calf and in the end has been healed. What did I put in his, this slide? I remember again, don't start a wound healing without an echography result. Otherwise you can do a lot of damage on. And in the end, that, whole, uh, that wound has been healed. What I'm trying to say as a nurse, two, two more important things. One of them is realize what grade of wound have you got there. And in this case, we've got one to two grade because there are four grades. And secondly, respect the rules of healing the wound. First of all is debridation, as you already talked about then. That is granulation, the new tissue is growing up. And the third one is epitalization. And when you can say that wound has been healed, right? Next one, a very important thing that we apply in the last two years, is the IPC treatment. We are helping people after, uh, after being healed, not during the healing process, but after that, a home to use this device in order to reduce the reflux and helping um, their veins do not swollen again and they have a recurrence of the vein ulcer. The next case, we've got a same uh, vein also on the uh, bottom side of the calf, as you can see, is a grade three. But uh, what is so important is not very infected. As you can see, the skin around it's got a big, uh, small pigmentation, but not a big pus or yellow slough or green slough in that one. So after a period of time and applying uh, modern dressing, I'm going to show you in the next cases the wound has been healed. The next case is we've got a dramatic one. As you can see, there is a necrotic one tissue over there. Look at the difference between the left and the right lower limb. Look at the pigmentation that we're gonna show you where the uh, insufficient vein uh, failure is. And from his uh, lock, what happened? He's got a good pulse on his foot. And that will give our chance to lead this for, for healing. After applying the dressings, look at this, what happened after first week when it's coming out, because applying these modern dressings, we, we, the patient are coming once a week or maybe once nine or 10 days, but when it's leaking like this and when you go all that leakage on, definitely you can or patient could come twice a week. 
I just put in here some dressing that we're using for one of them, one of the gel, as you said, is for a chemical debridement, but in the same time, it's, um, uh, how can I say, uh, bring more granulation, it's give more powerful to grow up a bit better. We've got asking, you know, permaform, we've got, uh, give you the uh, silver argin dressings. And of course, the permaform who takes all that leakage out and keep it there. And you can see in the, in the top picture, the uh, feet are getting less swollen and the pigmentation is getting back. What happened next? I just apply that dressing on. I just put a vela band on to make sure there is no friction and that can lead to another ulcer. But of course, the most important things is a compression layer dressing. Definitely from my point of view, and I'm speaking with my uh, experience, uh, you cannot healing a wound, a ulcer wound, uh, with, uh, uh, if you don't start with a compression dressing. And if you have a chance over here, uh, I will ask uh, Mr. Luca to, to send me that device to see how many uh, germs I've got in this wound. And if anybody have any macus there and it have anything to do with them, can bring them to Romania. I really need that one to clean that wound for me, right? So like a joke. And uh, yeah, compression, very important one. And as you can see, the both legs are getting down swollen. The oedema are disappearing step by step. The wound is getting smaller and just a part of a, a, a yellow slough is still there on the right calf, but all the other one has been healed. And in the end, both legs are looking amazing, but just we have already talked about that. What do you think happened with them after he left me? I just put the tech, tech stocking on and what do you think he did? Look how did he come back to me? I was just ready to scream. What are you doing my dear friend? So make sure you do an education with your patient. Make sure he is wearing the tech stocking in the right position. Don't let him to do that. So from that reason, every week for the next one month, he coming to me to see how he's wearing his tech stocking. Yeah. Wear test stockings, from my point of view, everybody, before you got any sign of symptoms, wear test stocking after healing process during the compressive uh, layer bandage. But honestly, I'm telling you, I've got small vein ulcer and the patient couldn't offer all this dressing to put it on. And I use a compression class three, 40, 50 milligram AG. And what do you think? That wound has been healed. Probably you don't believe me, but it happened. It happened just wearing a tat stocking without a compression dressing before. Right, and then next case, the next case is one of the common from my point of view. Most of them are, uh, the, the vein also are situated in the internal or external side of the ankle where the forefoot is coming up and down on the calf. And this is a grade four, definitely. Please don't forget the grade before you start uh, uh, healing this kind of, uh, uh, this kind of ulcer. Uh, we've got a necrotic side, not a big one. We've got yellow sloth, definitely. We've got a bit of red granulation in the bottom of the wound because always a wound must be healed what? from the bottom to the top and from the outside to inside. And that way you can see that uh, healing is successful because you are sure there is nothing like pus or uh, fibrin or yellow sloth remain on the bottom one and you've got a false healing that it happened not or usually in a in a uh, ulcer vein ulcer but you can have it in a diabetic foot when you've got a, a toe amputation when you've got a, or a arterial ulcer and you know how the process is it's harder and is getting more than a vein also where the arterial system is working absolutely magnifical. I've just put another type of dressing in here. I just want to make a big comparison of them, right? But uh, the, the, the most important thing definitely was a compression one and reduce 
reduce the, the volume. And in the end, uh, the wound is getting red. Is getting, as you can see in this case, even pigmentation is come down very, very good. We've got part of epitalization. And in the end, everything has been healed and patient went home wearing a tet stocking uh, nevertheless. Right, one more thing, the conclusion. What is that the conclusion from my point of view? Uh, just because I've been doing this for, how can I say, there are more than 10 years, it was my patient and I cannot say 100% the conservative management, it's a safe one. Of course, when you need to lead to a surgical point, when you need to, to, to go further, or the patient has got more comorbidities or he might have or anesthesia high risk, first of all, try with the conservative management and is working. For my experience as well, I'm just saying that the vein ulcer is the easier one to heal in comparison with arterial, with diabetic one, with vasculitis, where the supplies of blood and oxygen is worse than a uh, vein problem, the other one, right? So thank you very much. Appreciate for listening to me. Appreciate you have, uh, I don't know how to say, the pleasure to listen to stuff nurse. And uh, what can I say then? I love the Chronicles. They are my life. And uh, this is all I can say for the moment. Thank you very much. And please don't forget, vein also is healing 100%. With all together, working together, we can manage to do that. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. I can't hear you. Yes, thank you very much for a great presentation and the great enthusiasm. Thank we can you. see how you love your work. Um, you share with us quite a bit of your experience, which I'm sure is huge. We all have benefited from your technique, your strategy, and the way you uh, um, treat your venous ulcer and the successful result. I will uh, uh, open the discussion to our co-moderator and panelists, if someone have a question, uh, please go ahead. I'd just like to say thank you, Kat, for an absolutely fantastic presentation coming from the nursing perspective, because I think that is really important to get across to yeah. other colleagues as well, that, you know, the consultants and nurses can work together to successfully manage these patients as absolutely, well. Absolutely, love. Absolutely, we're right. teamwork. We can't work just me and that. No, I can't do that one. No. I just try to supply a bit the doctor job and echography job, but I just focus on my one. But I just want to say thank you, Tracy. Thank you, England, for the time I spent there. And a special one, as Mr. Omo said, you've got a good job there. You've got a tissue viability nurse who is very yes. good trained and he can give you the chance to learn how to manage a chronic wounds. And of course, you've got good sisters and good mentors, of course, on the word that really helped me a lot to improve this vision in how to manage because he's not talking about just that wound. We are just talking about a holistic caring of your patient. Not only when he's there on your bed, you do the change the dressing and then you go. God is helping you. It's true, God is helping you, but you need to be there. You need to help himself and yourself as well if you want to succeed you need his family you need his friends you need all your colleagues all together you can't work just you and that's it you can't do that one so that we are here to learn from you and to teach us all you can do and this is the progress this is the progress all together we can deal uh, easily with this uh chronicles definitely we can do that one so thank you. Congratulations on a wonderful presentation. Thank yes, you. Yes, absolutely. Love. Fantastic. So any of our kind panelists to like to ask a question uh, to benefit from cat experience and from uh, Christian Celo's experience? Uh, Christian, I have a question to you. Yeah. Congratulations. I like your enthusiasm. It's absolutely fantastic. You know, like you. everybody are keeping with the world. And so, of course, 
what is your opinion about this uh, category, which are very common in Balkan region, these obese people of food? Is this the most difficult things to deal with that? In middle in middle uh, Europe, in the middle in uh, in Asia, everywhere, people with weight also and uh, high obesity or obese. And also, I don't I want to trace to be involved in it. To be, of course, we know that. When someone uh, arrives to this situation, there is a lot of things to be involved, Venus, psychological effect, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. Venus studies, overweight kilo. So yeah, of, yeah. Of, no, the biggest failure is from this person. I will know these people who are coming from the car. So what is your perspective, Christian, about this? Do you have some kind of algorithm in Romania? How do you treat these people? Yeah. yeah as, okay, you go. Uh, in, in my experience, uh, in Romania, the people uh, arrived uh, arrive, uh, to the doctor um, in the uh, sev sev severe um, uh, affection in, uh, in the six or uh, five uh, uh, state uh, of insufficiency, venous insufficiency. And um, uh, I think that uh, the communication with the patient is uh, very important to explain uh, the advantages uh, of uh, compression, uh, uh, advantages of uh, um, and opportunity of, inter of uh, surgical intervention if you have uh, an indication for that uh, uh, is very very important to explain um, all the things uh, uh, to the patient if the patient uh, understand uh, all the uh, all this uh, problem they they will uh, uh, do uh, all is all, the, all it is uh, necessary. Yeah, if, if, excellent. Yeah. I, I like to. Yeah, what do you like to add, Kat? Yeah. yeah, I just want to add something very important. When a patient is coming in, one of these uh, obesity is the I can say is the worst part for the vein system because all that weight is pressing the vein, who is trying to push up the blood with. Um, uh, dioxide of carbon, right? So when a patient is coming, he knows already that that one, obesity, it might be one of that problem, why he's got swollen legs, why that legs is uh, leaking, why he's got wound there. So you need to be gentle with him. You just try to explain he's got another problem. He might be solved, as we said, like an interdisciplinary team, a nutritional a specialist that can help him to reduce that uh, things. And in the same time, to realize that from that moment, we will fight together, everybody on his step and on his job, because otherwise he won't be like, how can I say, okay, I came here, he's telling me the same thing, he's doing nothing, I'm going home and that's it. And what are you doing? You're losing, you are doing nothing with them, right? So gently, happily, with love, because we need to love our patient, our patient, our life, and the wounds of our life. And after that, definitely, he will be complying on your job. And I'm sure everybody trying to, to, to fight for his health. So yeah, not the only one, teamwork and the patient is a holistic game. It's not for him. It's all together, all his steps. As Virginia Henderson said, all 40 needs should be punch and that moment i'm sure we can we can win that patient definitely excellent excellent it's a great answer and the great benefit to Thank all you. the attendee uh, now the time for the last the polling uh, and then i will wrap up the uh, the congress message so um I think we've heard a lot about compression therapy throughout the sessions um, today. So what is the primary purpose of compression stockings? Oh, so would you say that that is to improve circulation, decrease swelling or increase flexibility? So we'll have um, 30 seconds for you all to answer.
I would like just in the meantime to say a message that uh, we are dealing with disease where the quality of life is as bad as cancer colon. And the venous ulcer, the quality of life as bad as cancer lung. Mm -hmm. So uh, I have seen, unfortunately, my practice people who have bilateral amputation due to venous ulcer. We hope we don't see this in the future. So we'll uh, see the result of the poll and I will conclude the message. Okay, so we've got a bit of a split here, Omar. We've got to improve circulation and to decrease mm -hmm. swelling. So I think a little bit of, of both there. We do know that we need the, the um, compression stockings to help to get the venous system um, yeah. pump. Um, but ultimately, if we don't reduce edema, we're not going to get good wound healing either. So I think from both perspectives, we can um, say that those are, I think, evenly yeah. right. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I will accept the both as correct answers uh, because there is a lot of evidence that stocking improve venous drainage, which is circulation and definitely improve edema as well. Yeah. So thank you very much for all attendee. Uh, I'm really honored and delighted with such a fascinating lectures with fascinating experience definitely the future will see more problem with venous ulcer definitely the future will see more modality will see a lot of artificial intelligence and machine learning have an impact into this practice we hope to find the standardization of management of venous ulcer which i'm sure is difficult but we all are in the stage of learning from each other uh, sure, there is genetic predisposition in venous ulcer in each of European countries, so we're not dealing with the same disease. But at least, uh, thank you very much to show us the way how you can deal with a disease as vicious as venous ulcer in a pragmatic way, enthusiastic way, scientific way, what is expensive and what is cheap, what it works and what doesn't, ideally it benefit a lot. And for all the attendee, uh, this webinar will be live on the on the YouTube channel uh, by MOH, which is very good. So if, if you have more questions, even after the lecture is gone or you didn't have time to attend, we'll delighted to have your feedback. I would like to thank my co-moderator, uh, Tracy, for such a great uh, co-moderation. And the panelists, you are just fantastic. Uh, God bless you all. And thank you very much. Thank you, Omar. Thank, thank you very you. much. Thanks, thank everybody. Thank you very much. Thank you, Raddy. And thank you from Sigvaris. Thank you. Yes. Thank you. Have a nice evening. Bye-bye.